Hello everybody and welcome back to the Inner Sanctum YouTube channel. I'm your host, Aris Matakos, and we're back with episode 4 of Player Spotlight. Now, for those who haven't seen this series before, firstly, go back and watch the first three episodes that are already up on the YouTube channel. But secondly, basically, this is where we go through some players who are on the periphery of the Socceroos squad, on the fringes, and just look to see where they are in Graham Arnold's plans heading into the World Cup in November. So, as you can tell by the title and the thumbnail, this episode is on Connor Metcalf, so let's get into it. So who is Connor Metcalf? Well, he's a 22-year-old central midfielder, represented Australia under 20, under 23's level, and of course as a soccer route, which, he, which he's played three times for the senior side, which we'll touch on a little bit later, of course. Like a lot of p players on this series already, he is a Melbourne City Youth Academy product, being signed on a scholarship basis, and he made his debut in 2017, coming on as a substitute against the Central Coast Mariners. He was voted in the PFA's A-League Team of the Season for season 2020-2021, as well as being awarded the Harry Kuehl Medal for that season, which is being Australia's best young player. He was transferred to, to German second division side St. Pauli um, in the, in the off-season, already making one appearance as a sub substitute for him, where, of course, he joins current soccer and teammate Jackson Irvine. So let's go through who is Conor Metcalf on the pitch, and let's take a deeper look at his midfield profile. So let's take a look at Connor Metcalf's player profile. Now, before we get into the heat map and start dissecting where he is positionally and what he offers on the pitch, let's take a look at some of the key attributes of his game. Now, what sets him apart from the rest isn't something obvious, I feel. Like, he doesn't have a physical attribute that sets him apart from the rest. He isn't overly tall, overly strong, or quick, or anything like that. He's just a very, very technically capable, capable and technically gifted central midfielder that relies on his football IQ and his intelligence of the game structurally very aware, systematically very aware of what he needs to do on the pitch, and that's what sets him apart from the rest. I feel like he's a coach's dream, in a sense, because he seems like a very coachable player who understands most positions on the pitch, understands most roles as well, so he's very fluid and adaptable to certain scenarios. Now, let's bring up his heat map, as we always do for players on this series. Now, what we can see here is that he actually offers, he's a left-sided central midfielder firstly, and that's something which we haven't covered on this series a whole lot, but he's a left-footed, left-sided central midfielder, and there's a couple of aspects of this game. As you can see, he does like to occupy that half space quite a lot, but he also likes to drift out wide, and this is another avenue where he shows his tactical versatility and tactical fluidity, because more and more in the common, in the common game, in the modern game, we're seeing inverted fullbacks being used a lot more and this now relies on on central midfielders being a lot more versatile whether that's them pushing up along the front line or even pushing pushing wide and acting almost as wingers or pseudo wingers in a sense now what we see if we bring it up one more time is that there is a lot of red and there is a lot of emphasis on the attacking half as well as the defensive half of the pitch now like we saw with Dennis Genro who was more of a attacking central midfielder who kind of played as a number eight Connor Metcalf while he does offer those type of runs and while he is that type of player he does also offer us some box-to-box -box assets as well which allows him to just fit into different systems and under different in different forms formations and under different coaches as well. If we just highlight some of his stats last season, he had the second highest assists for Melbourne City last year with five throughout the season. He gets into and another uh, uh, stat that really shows just how fluid he is, is that he has 14.83 accurate final third passes per 90. Now, this was a high stat for Melbourne City last season, and it just shows how, yes, he's defensively sound, and yes, he is a, like a box-to-box -box midfielder, but he does have that attacking verve. He does have that av avenue to his game where he can really influence in the final third, and Another stat that shows this is his 1.6 key passes per game. Now, for Melbourne City and for um, for Australia, he has played is as in both a double pivot and an, as an outside central midfielder. This versatility versatility is just very crucial because the modern game is really heavily influenced by tactical fluid, fluidity from players, players being able to play multiple different roles, and Conor Metcalf is a prime example of that. Like I said, he did transfer to German side St. Pauli in the offseason, and I feel like he'll fit this division very well. It's a high-paced, frantic division at times, and this will suit his technical ability perfectly because he's able to play through a press, he is press-proof at times, and he can give St. Pauli a new dimension playing in a, in a as a left-sided central midfielder in a midfield three. So that was his club career, and that's his heat map, what he offers for Melbourne City. Let's take a look at his Socceroos career to date, and let's dissect the games that he's played for the Socceroos so far. 
So let's take a look at Conor Metcalf's Socceroos career to date. As I mentioned at the top of the show, he has played three times for the senior side and he made his debut like Denis Genro did in his last episode. He made his debut against Chinese Taipei back earlier on in the World Cup qualification campaign. Now, he actually came on as a substitute in that game, came on in the 65th minute and he played in a double pivot in that game. I can't remember who it was alongside against, but he was the more attacking player in that double pivot, getting into advanced areas. He occupied that zone 14 um, area quite well. Now that is, for those who don't know, that's the area just outside the penalty box where the D is. Um, that area of the pitch he really occupied and really, really was able to make an influence of the game through that area. Now he didn't have enough time to really make an impact. It was of course the 65th minute and Australia had the game won by that stage and the game was done, like I said, so there wasn't a whole lot to speak about. But where we really saw his class was in his second game against Nepal not long after. He played the full 90 minutes, played in the left hand side of a midfield double pivot once again and he was he was very attacking and such a key cog in Australia's offensive mach- machine that day he had a 91% pass completion rate he had three successful tackles and won 50% of his ground duels so this versatility that, that I mentioned before, that box-to-box nature of him is really shown through their stats because the 91% pass completion rate shows his press-proof ability and his ability to play through a press and really dictate tempo. However, the 50% ground duels won and the three successful tackles shows that he's defensively capable as well. Now, His most recent game came against Japan um, back in the games in March. He played on the left-hand side of a double pivot once again, so that's really where he's made his name as a Socceroo. And he didn't have the best of times. He got subbed off at halftime for Jimmy Jago now, which when looking at the stats and watching the game back, it was quite surprising that that substitution was made because he had a 79% pass completion rate for the first half, made two key passes, which is already higher than his average for Melbourne City throughout the whole season. He had two key passes in the first half in that game. So it was, you can't really analyze this game a whole lot because he only played 45 minutes, but there were glimpses of brilliance there for um, Conor Metcalf. And we could see that if you're given the time and if given the opportunities, he could be a really key player for the Socceroos in the near future. Now, as we do with this series, let's finish up and let's take a deep look at where does Conor Metcalf's future lie for the Socceroos. Now, let's take a look at the Socceroos' future for Conor Metcalf. Now, to put it blunt, it's not 100% guarantee that he'll make the World Cup squad. With the amount of depth that the Socceroos have in midfield, it will be interesting to see whether he gets in the squad, let alone any minutes in the World Cup. Now, he was fantastic for Melbourne City last season, and this move to St. Pauli could be the catalyst for him to be able to show his quality against higher quality opposition and in a higher quality league. Now, he will be competing with the likes of Jago, Jackson Irvine, Dennis Genro for that kind of third or fourth midfield role, assuming that Aaron Moy and Adrian Hustic do start the games if they're fit, of course. Now, he's a high energy and slightly more box-to-box nature, slightly more versatile nature, could hold him in good stead if Graham Arnold wants to be slightly more defensively compact and, and wants his midfield to be high energy and being able to cover the ground a lot more. He does offer that. He has a really good tank as well, so he'll be able to get up and down the ground all day, no problem. Now, like I said, his stint at at, at St. Pauli is going to be very crucial to see whether or not he makes the World Cup squad because Graham Arnold has obviously favoured those playing in Europe, playing against high-quality opposition and playing more often against against players that play on the international stage. So getting that European experience will now put him into the bracket put him into the same bracket as those he is competing against. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not he hits the ground running in Germany. And if he does, then expect to see him on the fringes of the Socceroos squad. And I feel like if he does get there, I feel like he'll be able to add something very valuable for the Socceroos in the World Cup. So yes, thank you all very much for watching. That has been episode four of Player Spotlight covering Connor Metcalf. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. Let me know players that you want to see be given a Player Spotlight in the future. Make sure you subscribe to the Inner Sanctum YouTube channel, like the video. See you guys next time and goodbye.